Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Today, Skylake versus Broadwell E, which should you choose, part two. I have previously filmed a video on this topic, link in the video description below to that if you're interested. However, if you have not seen it, that's okay. This is a self-contained video. Now, the purpose of a follow-up video is simply this. There were enough questions, comments, concerns, and feedback from the first video that I felt a follow-up was justified, and I thought I would make this more concise, shorter, and to the point. So let me be very clear this time. There are benefits to Skylake, there's benefits to Broadwell E. Which one you choose depends on what kind of computer user you are. Let me separate this into two groups. Gamers and general PC computer users, and then high-end users who are either content creators, developers, uh, heavy multitaskers, or people who run large databases or virtual machines. Let's talk about gamers first. If you're primarily a gamer and a general uh, Windows PC user, you, you browse the web, you watch videos, you play some games, you just use a computer, Broadwell E is not for you. There is no reason to consider it. Don't even think about it. Skylake is fine. In fact, Skylake at either an i5-6500 or the i5-6600K that I have here is really all that you need, even if you're a high-end gamer, even if you want to play the latest and greatest games, that's all you need. I've got an Asus Z170A motherboard here, an i5-6600K processor. They make a great combination. They will play all current games in as good a detail as your graphics card will allow. And it's worth noting that because the primary limitation to gaming performance is your graphics card, not your processor. If you've got a good enough graphics card, if you've got a high-end graphics card, all of these CPUs will run games at basically the same performance. There's no difference between any of them, give or take 2%. So if you're just gaming and just using a computer for general computing tasks, an i5 is all you need. Now having said that, many people then ask, well, yeah, an i5 is nice, but what about this i7-6700K? It goes nicely on a Z170A motherboard. I'll just go ahead and get that. It's only $100 more, right? Well, here's the problem with that. It is $100 more, but almost nobody needs it. Gaming, no difference, with maybe one or two exceptions. I'm sure somebody's going to point out the one exception, which is Arma 3, which will benefit from it. But beyond that example, everything from Fallout 4 to Grand Theft Auto 5 to Overwatch to every other game you can imagine, there is no performance difference between the i5 and the i7 chips of any variety. In the video description below, I will put a link to Anatech.com's excellent Skylake review. Now, that review is not recent per se, it's when these chips came out, but it's very detailed and the link will take you directly to page 22 of that review. It's very detailed. On that page, you will see benchmarks of games and they tested them on multiple processors with multiple high-end graphics cards, high-end AMD and high-end NVIDIA graphics cards. If you look at that review and you look at that page, look at Alien Isolation, look at Grand Theft Auto V. There is less than one frame per second difference between the i5 and the i7 Skylake chips. If you're just gaming, save your money, get the i5-6600K, put the extra money into a better graphics card. Now having said that, will Broadwell E game? Absolutely. But you shouldn't buy it for gaming. You should buy it for non-gaming tasks. So that's gaming and general computer tasks. What about content creation? such as video editing, video rendering, 3D animation, and large format image work. And I'm not talking about pictures you took with your iPhone. I'm talking about professional photography with professional cameras that you're editing in Adobe Photoshop with lots of effects. Broadwell E can help you there. What if you run a lot of virtual machines? And I don't mean just one or two for fun. I mean, maybe you're a developer and you've got four to eight virtual machines running and you may have background tasks running in, in multiple virtual machines. Broadwell E will make a big, big difference. Maybe you are a heavy multitasker and you may have multiple programs running at the same time. You've got files syncing with a remote work location. Maybe you've got files compressing or decompressing in the background. Maybe you want to be able to work on a work project while playing a game and watching videos and, and you just want to run 10 things at once that are busy. Broadwell E is for you. Now, will Skylake do those things? Yes, but Broadwell E will do them better. I'll give you a specific example. 
i7-6700K will generally overclock to 4.6 to 4.8 gigahertz. I'll use the specific example of 4.6 because that's the one I'm familiar with. At 4.6 gigahertz, compared to Broadwell E's i7-6800K at 4.2 gigahertz, Broadwell E will render videos in Adobe Premiere Pro 30% faster. That is a huge performance difference. Now, it's not 50% faster. In the previous video, I talked about the fact that Broadwell E has 50% more cores than Skylake. i7-6700K has four cores and eight threads, whereas Broadwell E's i7-6800K has six cores and 12 threads, and I don't have enough fingers to show you 12 threads. That's 50% more cores and 50% 50 50 more threads. It's not actually 50% faster. It does run at a slightly slower clock speed, but it is faster. How much faster? 25 to 35% faster in the real world for the tasks that I mentioned. Gaming, general computer use, it's no faster. But for the items I mentioned, it is. And in Adobe Premiere Pro and video rendering, it's about 30% faster at 4.2 gigahertz versus 4.6 on Skylake. Part of that is the two extra cores. Part of it is it also has 15 megabytes of level three cache instead of eight in Skylake. Part of it is the 28 lanes of PCI Express versus 20 lanes of PCI Express, which matters sometimes and not others, depending on how many devices are connected to your machine. And part of it is the quad channel memory interface. Scott, uh, Broadwell E brings to it quad channel, four channel memory. It transfers, reads and writes memory twice as fast as Skylake does. For gaming and for general consumer use, this makes zero difference whatsoever. But for memory intensive tasks such as video rendering, 3D rendering, multiple virtual machines, heavy multitasking, it does make a difference because all those tasks have a lot of reads and writes to memory very quickly and the additional memory bandwidth makes a difference. Now, having said that, let me talk about price for a minute. All other considerations aside, the motherboard price difference and the processor price difference between i7-6700K and i7-6800K, today, in August, when I'm filming this video, is $175. Now, wait a minute, you may say, that's a lot of money. I could buy a lot of other things with $175. Yes, you could, but you have to put it in perspective with the cost of your entire computer. If you're thinking of building a high-end i7-6700K machine, you're not just buying a $345 processor, which is what this costs today. You're buying a $1,500 to $2,000 machine. The whole machine, the case, the power supply, the motherboard, the RAM, the video card, the solid-state drives, the hard drives, the DVD drive, everything that goes into the machine adds to the cost. In my previous video, the example I gave, and the numbers will change, and I will put new numbers up here, but the previous example was $1,700. That was for case, power supply, motherboard, RAM, graphics card, cooling solution, the whole nine yards. So if you're going to spend $1,700, as an example, on i7-6800K, then $175 more is 10% more money for your total system to go from 6700K to 6800K. 10% more money gets you an average of 30% more real world performance if you're doing those tasks. That's a deal. All day long, anytime you can spend 10% more and get 30% more whatever, that's a good deal. Now, if you don't need the extra performance because you're just gaming and browsing the web, you shouldn't buy either one of these. You should buy the i5, not any i7. You don't need an i7 anything for gaming and general computing tasks. All you need is an i5. You can, but consider this. The price to jump from the i5 to the i7 is a hundred, just over a hundred dollars. It's 175 more to jump 
to I-7 6800K. But the jump from here to here only gets you hyper-threading and two megabytes of level three cache. That's it. These two processors are basically identical. For the extra $100, the only thing you do is you go from, on the i5, it's four cores and four threads, to the i7 is four cores and eight threads. It makes, at most, a five to 10% difference in non-games, in heavy multitasking. Not a huge difference, but it makes a small difference. In gaming and general computing tasks, it makes no difference. And you get 25% more level two cache. It goes from six megabytes to eight. That makes no difference for most people. It's just a waste of $100. Go put it in your graphics card. Go get a nice solid state drive. Get a nice case. Get a better monitor. Put that $100 where you'll see it and notice it. If you want more performance than the i5 gives you, I submit that you should skip the i7-6700K and leapfrog to Broadwell E, because if you need more than an i5, I think you need to be on the enthusiast platform with quad channel memory, 28 PCI Express lanes, six real cores, 15 megs of level three cache, and a better overall platform for heavy computer users. That doesn't make the i7-6700K bad, if they knocked $50 off, if there was only a $50 price difference between these two, I'd feel differently. I think $100 is too much just to pay for hyper-threading. Because you aren't getting four more cores. You're getting four pretend cores. It's not the same thing. So, in a follow-up to my previous video, if you're going to jump over i5, skip the 6700, go to 6800. That's still my recommendation six weeks after posting the first video. That's what I think. Now, in the previous video, I had many people ask, what about Haswell E, the previous chip? Now, the i7-6800K is the newest and greatest six-core chip that Intel makes for general consumer, consumer use. The previous chip to this was called Haswell E, and it was i7-5820K. Should you buy one? That depends on what you can get the price for it. Um, on Amazon, on the day I filmed this video, the price difference between Haswell E and Broadwell E was $35. For $35, forget it, just get Broadwell E. In the benchmarks that I have seen, now I don't own a Haswell E, but in multiple benchmarks, Broadwell E is anywhere between 5 to 10% faster, give or take, depending upon how much overclock you get out of each chip. For $35, if you're going up to this platform buying a $250 motherboard and building a $1,900 computer, give or take, spend the $35 and get the newest chip. However, there are deals that come out from time to time. Um, if you find the price difference is larger, maybe you're not in the United States, maybe wherever you live, the price difference is greater. If it was a $100 difference, absolutely. I'd buy Haswell E all day long, the i7-5820K. But for $35, which was the price on Amazon, but the difference between the two chips on the day I filmed this, not a chance in the world. So whether you should buy the older revision depends entirely upon what kind of price you can get it for. If it's cheap enough, sure, but otherwise, if it's less than $50, don't bother, just get Broadwell E. If it's more than 50, it becomes a maybe. It just comes down to your personal preference as to whether the last five or 10% performance matters to you or not. I hope this video was helpful to you. If it was, give it a like. If it wasn't, you know what to do. Remember to subscribe to my channel. It's the big, huge red button right down there where you'll get updates to all kinds of future videos, including build videos. I've recently done a build video of a basic $350 machine. I will be working my way up the price ladder doing ever more fancy machines until I finally do a sky's the limit machine, which will be a lot of fun. But that'll be coming probably in a month or so. Now, Questions, comments, thoughts, feedback, suggestions, those go below the video description below. You guys left lots of comments in the last one. I certainly hope you leave lots in this one, uh, both positive and negative. So long as they're constructive criticism, I certainly don't mind. By all means, leave your feedback below. And as always, if you want to support my channel, if you like the videos I make, if you found this informative or at least it simulated your thought process and got you thinking about the options, please consider using the links in my video description below. There's links to Amazon, Newegg, and eBay down there. They will all help me out and support my channel. If you want to see me making more videos, that's the best way to support me. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you in the next video.